Coming up on the program, Gregory Stockel and Jill Robbins have a story on an Ohio museum that shows the history of television technology. Faith Perlow explains the difference between the words teen and tween, and we listen to part two of The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane. But first... The history of television began long before millions of Americans gathered in front of their black and white sets and watched shows like Lucy, Uncle Milty, and Howdy Doody. Everybody thinks TV started in the 50s or the late 40s, said Steve McVoy. Almost nobody knows it existed before World War II and even goes back to the 20s. McVoy is the founder and president of the Early Television Museum in Hilliard, near Columbus in the state of Ohio. The museum holds a large collection of televisions from the 1920s and 1930s. It has many of the post-World War II black and white sets that changed the entertainment industry. There are also several early color sets developed in the 1950s. The original idea for the museum was to deal with the earliest television technology, McVoy said. The sets got pretty boring after 1960, just these big things in plastic cabinets. Doron Galili is a researcher of media studies at Stockholm University, Sweden, and writer of Seeing by Electricity, The Emergence of Television, 1878 to 1939. He visited the museum in 2016. He said the museum not only gives the technological history of television, but also its place within popular culture and modern design and material culture. As a child, McVoy would walk around his neighborhood in Gainesville, Florida, with a sign that advertised free television repairs. Nobody accepted my offer, he said adding it was unlikely he could have repaired a set if anyone had asked. A few years later, McVoy worked in a television repair shop and learned those skills. He opened his own shop, Freedom TV, in the mid-1960s. He then formed businesses related to the television industry. Finally, in 1999, he sold his holdings and, looking for something to do, decided to start collecting old television sets. The first set he bought was an RCA TRK-12, which was introduced at the 1939 World's Fair. I think I paid about a thousand for it, McVoy said, adding that it was in disrepair and missing several parts. A complete one would have cost five or six thousand. The pre-war sets are very valuable. McVoy opened the Early Television Museum in 2002. It is housed in a large former storage building. Each room has an audio guide voiced by McCoy. Visitors can also watch a few old shows on some of the sets. Until a few years ago, McVoy helped repair many of the museum's televisions himself. My eyesight and the stability of my hands makes it difficult now, he said. Early televisions were first developed in the mid-1920s by John Logie Baird in England and Charles Jenkins in the United States. Information from the museum says that by 1930, television was being broadcast from over a dozen stations in the U.S. Not only in the major cities such as New York and Boston, 
but also from Iowa and Kansas. The television screens at the time were small. The picture quality was extremely poor with limited programming. Television, McVoy said, made its big entrance to the public on April 30th, 1939. That was the time U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt opened the World's Fair in New York with a live broadcast. Information from the museum says that about 7,000 sets were made in the United States in 1939 and 1940, and only about 350 still exist. World War II halted the production of TV sets in the United States, but technology from the war was used to make better TV when a large increase in sales and programming began. McVoy's research found there were about 200,000 sets in the U.S. in 1947 and 18 million by the end of 1953. Then came the popular I Love Lucy program in 1951 and the Honeymooners in 1955. Color television came in 1954. Sales began slowly because of the high cost. It was not until the early 1970s that color sets outsold black and white ones. The Early Television Museum collection is one of the world's largest. About 180 television sets are shown in order by age, with another 50 in storage. We have an example of virtually every set that is available, McVoy said. But he is still searching for one made by Philo Farnsworth in the late 1920s or early 1930s. Only three still survive, as far as we know. And they're all already in other museums, McVoy said. If a fourth ever shows up, we'd go to our donors and would be able to get it. I'm Jill Robbins. Hi there. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between teen and tween. Hello, VOA Learning English. I am Abdul Rahim from Somalia. Could you kindly explain and further explore the differences and usage between these two words, tweens and teens? Thanks, Abdul Rahim. Thank you for this interesting question, Abdul Rahim. Both words refer to very young people. There are major differences in the ages of these two groups. Let's look not only at the meanings of these two words, but also how they were made. Let's start with teen. The word teen is a noun that means a young person from ages 13 to 19. We get this word from the ending of the numbers, like 13, 14, 15, and so on. Many teens enjoy hanging out with their friends. When he was a teen, he loved the Beatles music. We combine teen with age to make teenage, an adjective that describes someone who is in their teens. The movie Mean Girls is about a group of teenage girls in high school. We can also add an ER ending to teenage to make another noun with the same meaning as teen. Some teenagers like to go against their parents. Now let's move on to tween. The word tween is a blend of the two words teen and between. It is a special blend word because it combines not only the spellings of the two words, but the meanings as well. 
the word is used to describe the age group between a child and a teenager. The earliest age for tweens is eight or nine years old, and the oldest age goes up to twelve. Many tweens go to a middle school after completing elementary, and before going to high school. Maria looks after tweens who are not old enough to be by themselves. We also call this group of young people preteens, with the prefix pre to mean before. A fun fact about the history of tween is that it may have come from J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the Lord of the Ring books. Some say he came up with tween to describe an in-between age for his characters called hobbits. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Abdi Rohim. Do you know any other blend words in English, or have a question about them? You can send these and other questions you have about American English to our email at learningenglish at voanews dot com. That was this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back to the show, Faith. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me back. So today's question was from Abdirahim in Somalia. He wanted to know the difference between teen and tween. That's right. This is a great question. Even I discovered new information about these two words. Both words were not used much until the latter half of the twentieth century. That was the late 1900s for our young listeners. Those words really took off in media and marketing. I do remember a lot of teen magazines and TV networks for tweens and teens specifically in the 1990s. I wasn't a teen until the year 2000, but I read teen magazines then. Another interesting point with the word tween. Remember when I said it was a special kind of blend word? Yes, and a reminder to our listeners that a blend word combines parts of two words together into one. That's right, Dan. So tween is actually a portmanteau blend word. A port, what? A portmanteau, which is actually a blend word itself in French. It is a special type of blend word. That combines not only the spellings of the two words, but combines the meanings as well. So, tween is a blend of teen and the word between, because tween is in between being a child and a teenager. That's really cool. Are there other examples of this kind of blend word? A portmanteau. There are lots of these words in English. For example, we have brunch, which is a blend of breakfast and lunch, to mean the late morning or early afternoon meal that many people enjoy on the weekends. When you go to brunch, you eat breakfast foods and lunch items. Oh, I think I know another one of those. Motel. Yes, that is a blend of motor and hotel. Motels were really popular in the U.S., especially in the 1950s and 1960s, because we drove everywhere. I guess we still drive everywhere. When we want to stay in a motel, we just drive right up to the door, park, and then go inside the motel room. Thanks for sharing a little more about tween and teen, and about these special blend words. You're welcome, Dan. Today, we will hear the second and final part of the story. Don't know whether there'll be a fight or not," answered one man firmly. "But there'll be some shooting, some good shooting." The young man who had warned them waved his hand. "Oh, there'll be a fight fast enough if anyone wants it. Anybody can get in a fight out there in the street. There's a fight just waiting." 
The salesman seemed to be realizing the possibility of personal danger. And what did you say his name was? he asked. Scratchy Wilson. The voices answered together. And will he kill anybody? What are you going to do? Does this happen often? Can he break in that door? No, he can't break in that door, replied the saloon keeper. He's tried it three times. But when he comes, you better lie down on the floor, stranger. He's sure to shoot at the door, and a bullet may come through. After that, the salesman watched the door steadily. The time had not yet come for him to drop to the floor, but he carefully moved near the wall. Will he kill anybody? he asked again. The men laughed without humor at the question. He's here to shoot, and he's here for trouble. I don't see any good in experimenting with him. But what do you do in a situation like this? What can you do? A man answered. Well, he and Jack Potter, but the other men interrupted together. Jack Potter's in San Antonio. Well, who is he? What's he got to do with this? Oh, he's the town policeman. He goes out and fights Scratchy when he starts acting this way. A nervous waiting silence was upon them. The salesman saw that the saloon keeper, without a sound, had taken a gun from a hiding place. Then he saw the man signal to him, so he moved across the room. You better come with me behind this table. No thanks, said the salesman. I'd rather be where I can get out the back door. At that, the saloon keeper made a kindly but forceful motion. The salesman obeyed and found himself seated on a box with his head below the level of the table. The saloon keeper sat comfortably upon a box nearby. You see, he whispered, Scratchy Wilson is a wonder with a gun, a perfect wonder. And when he gets excited, everyone gets out of his path. He's a terror when he's drunk. When he's not drinking, he's all right. Wouldn't hurt anything. Nicest fella in town. But when he's drunk, be careful. There were periods of stillness. I wish Jack Potter were back from San Antonio, said the saloon keeper. He shot Wilson once in the leg. He'd come in and take care of this thing. Soon... They heard from a distance the sound of a shot, followed by three wild screams. The men looked at each other. Here he comes, they said. A man in a red shirt turned a corner and walked into the middle of the main street of yellow sky. In each hand, the man held a long, heavy blue-black gun. Often he screamed, and these cries rang through the seemingly deserted village. The scream sounded sharply over the roofs with a power that seemed to have no relation to the ordinary strength of a man's voice. These fierce cries rang against walls of silence. The man's face flamed in a hot anger born of whiskey. His eyes, rolling but watchful, hunted the still doorways and windows. He walked with the movement of a midnight cat. As the thoughts came to him, he roared threatening information. The long guns hung from his hands like feathers. They were moved with electric speed. The muscles of his neck straightened and sank, straightened and sank as passion moved him. The only sounds were his terrible invitations to battle. The calm houses preserved their dignity at the passing of this small thing in the middle of the street. There was no offer of fight, no offer of fight. The man called to the sky. There were no answers. He screamed and shouted and waved his guns here and everywhere. Finally, the man was at the closed door of the saloon. He went to it and, beating upon it with his gun, demanded drink. The door remained closed. He picked up a bit of paper from the street and nailed it to the frame of the door with a knife. Then he turned his back upon the place and walked to the opposite side of the street. Turning quickly and easily, he fired the guns at the bit of paper. He missed it by half an inch. 
He cursed at himself and went away. Later, he comfortably shot out all the windows of the house of his best friend. Scratchy was playing with this town. It was a toy for him. But still, there was no offer of fight. The name of Jack Potter, his ancient enemy, entered his mind. He decided that it would be a good thing if he went to Potter's house and by shooting at it, make him come out and fight. He moved in the direction of his desire, singing some sort of war song. When he arrived at it, Potter's house presented the same steel front as had the other homes. Taking a good position, the man screamed an invitation to battle. But this house regarded him as a great stone god might have done. It gave no sign. After a little wait, the man screamed more invitations, mixing them with wonderful curses. After a while came the sight of a man working himself into deepest anger over the stillness of a house. He screamed at it. He shot again and again. He paused only for breath or to reload his guns. Potter and his bride walked rapidly. Sometimes they laughed together, quietly and a little foolishly. Next corner, dear, he said finally. They put forth the efforts of a pair walking against a strong wind. Potter was ready to point the first appearance of the new home. Then, as they turned the corner, they came face to face with the man in the red shirt, who was feverishly loading a large gun. Immediately the man dropped his empty gun to the ground and, like lightning, pulled out another. The second gun was aimed at Potter's chest. There was a silence. Potter couldn't open his mouth. Quickly he loosened his arm from the woman's grasp and dropped the bag to the sand. As for the bride, her face had become the color of an old cloth. She was motionless. The two men faced each other at a distance of nine feet. Behind the gun, Wilson smiled with a new and quiet cruelty. Tried to surprise me, he said. Tried to surprise me. His eyes grew more evil. As Potter made a slight movement, the man pushed his gun sharply forward. No, don't you do it, Jack Potter. Don't you move a finger toward a gun yet. Don't you move a muscle. The time has come for me to settle with you, and I'm going to do it my own way, slowly, with no interruption. So just listen to what I tell you. Potter looked at his enemy. I haven't got a gun with me, Scratchy, he said. Honest, I haven't. He was stiffening and steadying. But at the back of his mind floated a picture of the beautiful car on the train. He thought of the glory of the wedding, the spirit of his new life. You know I fight when I have to fight, Scratchy Wilson. But I haven't got a gun with me. You have to do all the shooting yourself. His enemy's face turned pale with anger. He stepped forward and whipped his gun back and forth before Potter's chest. Don't you tell me you haven't got a gun with you, you dog. Don't you tell me a lie like that. There isn't a man in Texas who ever saw you without a gun. Don't think I'm a kid. His eyes burned with anger and his breath came heavily. I don't think you're a kid, answered Potter. His feet had not moved an inch backward. I think you're a complete fool. I tell you I haven't got a gun and I haven't. If you're going to shoot me, you better begin now. You'll never get a chance like this again. So much enforced reasoning had weakened Wilson's anger. He was calmer. If you haven't got a gun, why haven't you got a gun? He asked. Been to church? I haven't got a gun because I've just come from San Antonio with my wife. I'm married, said Potter. And if I had thought there'd be a fool like you here when I brought my wife home, I would have had a gun, and don't you forget it. Married, said Scratchy, not at all understanding. Yes, married. I'm married, said Potter clearly. Married, 
said Scratchy. Seemingly for the first time, he saw the pale, frightened woman at the other side. No! he said. He was like a creature allowed a glance at another world. He moved a pace backward, and his arm with the gun dropped to his side. Is this the lady? he asked. Yes, this is the lady, answered Potter. There was another period of silence. Well, said Wilson at last, slowly, I suppose we won't fight now. We won't if you say so, Scratchy. You know, I didn't make the trouble. Potter lifted the bag. Well, I guess we won't fight, Jack, said Wilson. He was looking at the ground. Married. He was not a student of good manners. It was merely that in the presence of this foreign condition he was a simple child of the wildlands. He picked up his fallen gun and he went away.